Good morning everyone, welcome back to my channel. So I've finished stitching down all of the little elements that we placed. So in the last video we were sort of meandering our way across the piece, just attaching everything with tiny little stitches, some decorative stitches but nothing too bold and too um, overpowering because I just really wanted to get the fabric down and the lace down at this stage but everything is attached so no pins I did find the odd pin that I'd covered so there was a few tricky little maneuvers I had to do to get a pin that I'd covered in behind some fabric but they all came out no problems so what I've started doing now is having a think about the construction of it so as you know I want to put a piece of fabric here so I had two options I could create that piece of fabric now which was going to be <coughs> this um, sheeting this piece here so it'll be a piece torn to size and then placed on the back so as the postcards slide in they've got a nice uh, fabric sort of to slide past so none of these little edges would be in the way so from a uh, utilitarian concept you sort of need to be able to have things slide in and out of pockets easily when your journal or your piece that's holding paper um, is constructed so something to think about so I was lying in bed thinking well I want to put decorative stitches on top of all of these pieces of fabric do I put this through this this piece and then go for it and then on this side you would see all of my stitches that I do which in in itself can be quite beautiful or do I keep it just a simple piece of fabric and go through and do some invisible stitches to give it that quilted look right at the very end which I've decided to do so we're not yet going to work on this back section we are going to now go across this entire piece again with decorative stitching so it can be a combination of running stitches um, different threads different highlight stitches you know just sort of waltz my way across the piece enjoying I guess the the fabrics again it was lovely to do the invisible stitch because I really got to study the lace and that so I really feel like I want to go across the piece again. As it is now, it's fine and you could stop at this stage, but I can't help myself. So it's turning into a monumentous project, it would seem. So first of all, my thoughts on the threads to use. My go-to is Pearl Cotton number 8. I've been using this for years as my decorative um, stitching on top of whatever I'm doing I like the thickness I like um, the feel of it it shimmies through the fabric beautifully because it's got a pearlized finish it's just beautiful but I don't know I sort of felt like it was a bit too bold for this because some of these fabrics are so thin and so old and delicate to put this on top sort of didn't quite feel right it doesn't mean I might won't add it in some way so I sort of started thinking about what I had and I re remembered I had this skein of cotton now I bought this probably about three years ago from a Etsy store that sells French antique vintage fabrics threads and little odd bods you know you get all sorts of things on her site I'll link her below I know I shop from two and I'm just not sure which one I bought this from. So I'll probably put both of them there. I won't say the names yet because I sort of need to do a little bit of digging because it's been a little while since I've purchased from her. Now she has all sorts of treasures. Well, they both do. So check out the um, comments below, not the comments, the description below and you'll see the two links. Excuse me. <clears throat> so... I've used probably half of this skein over the years and there's still so much left. Now it's a antique cotton and it's so soft, so beautiful to work with. I've sort of forgotten about it a little bit. So when I got it, I've put it on a split ring and I just pull a thread out 
beautiful long length. And I thought, oh, what better piece to revisit this skein of cotton. And instead of going to my usual um, choice of thread. So what I've done so far, I don't know if you can see it real well, is see how there's running stitch through here. So I've been, I've started on this edge and just started doing running stitch, rows and rows of it. Where I get to the lace, I sort of sneak in under the lace. Where I get to a piece of fabric, in some cases I've just done every second row, so it's not as predominant over the piece. Like you can see there's a row through here, but I stopped. But the rows either side, I kept going. I just didn't want to overpower that little piece of fabric there, but I did like the look of having these little stitches go through. On the lace at the bottom here that goes right along the whole piece, I've just done a running stitch at the top, a running stitch at the bottom. And then when I got to this piece, I started feeling a little brave. So I was doing my running stitch just over the scrappy bit because this fabric is really thin, really thin, and it wouldn't take much to catch it and rip it. So any more stitches I could do on top would probably be a bit of a benefit. So using that cream cotton, I just started focusing just on this little piece. Then I thought, well, let's be a little brave. And I went to my um, cottons and I pulled out a DMC 498. This is one of my favorite colors that I use in my red work journals. Just, it's just one of those beautiful reds. It's not a fire engine red, it's more of a burgundy red. So what I've taken is only one thread, so really fine, and just done a few little rows of boro stitch or running stitch, camphor stitch, like there's so many names for this stitch. So you can see there's just three little rows of stitches there. So what I wanna do is carry on with the cream and just keep stitching down this little scrappy bit so that's what I'll do next. Um, in addition, when I got to this patch, now you can see it up here. See the patch there? That's already stitched down in the first wave of stitching, just using uh, cotton. So it's nice and secure. Now I'm coming back with this cotton, which is a little bit thicker, but not too thick, and going over all of those little stitches again to highlight the fact that it is stitched down. So that one there, I have finished. So I've tried to keep it not too uniformed, just fast stitch, you know, get it down, uh, let the stitches just lay where they wanna lay. So they're all different angles and shapes. I just think it makes it so much more interesting than sitting there concentrating on making it nice and neat like it would look like a blanket stitch or something. This piece has got a really rustic, messy feel about it. So stitches like that, I think, suit the piece. They don't always suit. Sometimes you've got to be a little bit more precise and really think about the placement of your stitches. Other pieces of fabric, I may not highlight anything because there's so much happening. Like this flower, I don't think I'll do anything around the outer edge of that because the flower is just so beautiful in itself. So... I don't think it needs a border enhancement is probably a better way to talk about what I'm trying to say here. I did a basic running stitch around this little guy here. Um, now the label, I came through and popped a little bit of glue in a few spots where it was just starting to lift. Then I decided with my um, thread is to put a line of stitching around the label. Let me bring it up to the camera. And you do have to be careful because you get one hit at where the hole comes through the paper. Paper is not very forgiving. Once you make that hole, it's, it's done. So you've got to be very careful. Take your time. This stitch at the top and at the bottom was quite long. So I was worried that something would catch. So I put a tiny little, bring it up to the camera, a tiny little stitch there and there just to help pin that down. Camp for stitch not camphor stitch, um, oh, I've gone blank. Um, oh, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. 
Don't even ask me what time of the morning it is because I couldn't sleep. I was thinking about this and I've just hopped up and started um, stitching. Uh, what's what's the, the, the stitch where you stitch over a thread? I know you are all yelling at the screen. Doesn't matter. It's gone. It'll come to me. It's technically not that anyway because I've just put the one stitch there just to hold that big long stitch on the paper. And even then, I probably should do a couple more just in case something catches it. But I'm going to leave it at that for now. Now, this little label, it looks like some point someone's tried to peel it off because you can see it has a little gold printed edge on the paper. It's sort of got a little bit of a shimmer about it. But at the top, a bit of it's peeled off. So the numbers are still there, but the two is missing a little bit of the ink due to that little torn edge. So what I did was put a double stitch there of my thread just to sort of, I don't know, highlight the detail, but disguise the detail. Does that make sense? So what else have I done? That little piece of lace that was gifted to me in the pack from Pauline, our French guide, um, I've stitched there. It was sort of floating around a little bit. I had tucked it in a few spots and then it sort of ended up there at that time and I just stitched it down. So I think that's everything you've caught up with. So I'm just going to grab myself out a thread. I'd forgotten how much I love this thread. Yes, it's fine. So you can do a lot of work and subtly see where you've been. I guess if you use these types of cottons, you get more bang for your buck. But um, this is just beautiful thread. So I've chosen a needle that is really sharp and st strong. If I've learned anything from my recent um, sashiko stitching is having a nice strong needle that is thicker or bigger than your thread really shoots you along fast when you're doing this type of stitching and what I mean by that is I'm just going to I might zoom in a little bit I hope I don't go off camera because the moment we zoom in on our work we tend to sort of lose track of where we are so I'm just going to come up between those red rows and do a few more look how long this thread is it's beautiful do a few more runs of this cream stitching just to intensify and see this because I've got this is Sashiko new skills I've learnt coming out I can stack that needle and because my thread is fine and my needle is thicker it just goes through like butter so I tell you, it pays to try some other stitches from other cultures or other projects from other cultures because you learn something every time and you can then drag it through to any project. So here's a Japanese style of stitching popping up in my French, French work. And if it's a way of taking the pressure off my fingers... Gee, why not drag different stitching techniques into our work? It was good to give my hands a rest for the week that I was in Paris because you can imagine I do a lot of needlework, hours and hours. So I do have to be mindful of the wear and tear on my hands. So if it means the tools and the threads can help me with longevity, I'm all for it. So really relaxing. This is what I think Slow Stitch is all about. Just putting thread and fabric together, layers and layers, and it just builds up. I know a few of them in YouTube world will say that your piece goes through an ugly stage. Totally agree. But then the more stitching and the more detail you add to it, it's like there's layers of a story coming together. Gee, I'm starting to sound all romantic, aren't I? Crazy. Crazy girl. It's that French experience coming out. 
Now the red thread, I don't want to go crazy with it. I just want it popping up here and there because I don't want it to overpower, overpower my piece. But I say that maybe it'll end up popping up a lot. I don't know. I think if I like the look that it gives me with a certain fabric, for example, this little piece, I might only use it when that little piece pops up. And if I feel like I need a little bit more of it, I can always cut another little piece off and add it somewhere and then do this little treatment over it. Gosh, the hours I've put into this so far, I don't know, what video are we up to? Five? Four? So there's an hour of filming for stitching and then I'm spending a day after that stitching and I got to the point where it was all stitched down. I'm thinking, right, oh, no, we're, we're done. But I'm like, no, I've got to do more. I can't let it go. I don't know why. I know I'll appreciate it more by putting in more of an effort now like while it's all able to be stitched I might as well I'm just enjoying the process does that make sense I could have been quick for the YouTube benefits you know five videos wham bam and we're out of there but I can't help myself I just have to do more stitching on it so I hope you do Want to hang around and see it all finished because I think it might take a few videos to get to where we want to get to. I'm still not sure about the booklets inside. Not sure what I'm going to do with those. I'd like to insert them. But I haven't really got that far yet to think about it. I've been just absorbed. It's been fun watching, uh, looking at all your comments because there's people from all over the world watching these videos. So a few of you have recognised laces from your countries. So not all is French here, it would seem. There's lace from Germany, there's lace from Switzerland, Sweden. It's been very interesting. So I guess being Europe, these countries really are not far from each other. And I guess whoever's sewing room that these laces came from and then the flea market vendors get hold of these goodies and I come along and pick them up. Technically, these laces could be from anywhere. So I have to say I've been to France to buy lace which could have come from anywhere in the world, which I think is lovely. Just goes to show, doesn't it? There's so much to know about lace. And it's been lovely having people go, oh, I know that lace, that's typical of my country. So how good is that? That's just so sweet. So I do thank you for those who've spotted something from their childhood or uh, their own collection. Oh, it's like, we just keep learning, don't we? It's great. So as for my French stories today, um, I thought I might chat briefly about the haberdashery stores that we went to see. We saw a few and they're scattered all over France and they're often in gorgeous little arcades around the place. Arcades were very popular back in the day because it was a place that the well-to-do would put their best best clothes on, their best shoes, their best hat, and spend the day promenading down the arcade, picking up little treasures. And of course, all of the vendors would be there hoping to tempt them with, a, you know, a purchase of some buttons or some braid or some fabrics, some laces. So you can imagine it was just oh, the best place to be. If I was to go back in time, I think I'd be straight into those promenades along those arcades, you know, picking up bits and bobs for my sewing room. It was very, very interesting. So we went to a heap. It was great. I didn't buy a lot from them. I sort of, 
I don't know, I sort of felt like everything I saw in there, I had a little bit of it already. So I, saw, oh, I, was, I was hanging out for the flea market, basically. I really wanted to get in amongst the fabrics and the laces, like you see here. With the haberdashery stores, they were just brimming with stuff. Oh, and it was all displayed in very old styles, like wooden boxes and on little shelves and... There were catalog numbers on everything, you know. It sort of remind me. I know this is British, you know the show "Are You Being Served?" And when you go into a level within that shop, it was a comedy, a British comedy. That you would get assistance to um, shop. That's what it was like. It was like um, you couldn't really take anything off the shelf yourself. You had to get a shop assistant to assist you and it was so cute it was it was like real old school real old school shopping just going to go up through that fabric technically i've missed a row i was doing it every two but i don't know what the hang i'm just going to go up there so it was like um, waiting for the shopkeep to serve you while you perused and then you would go around with them and say, I want that button, I want a little bit of that, I want a little bit of that. So it was really sweet, not very efficient, let me tell you. Times have changed. You sort of a little bit more take it off the shelf and go to the counter and have a metre of fabric cut for you. Or everything is packaged that you can pick it up off of a, a hook and drop it into a basket. So it really was the experience of probably shopping in the 1800s, which just made it so sweet. And there are quite a few around in Paris. We only visited a few, but still, I think we went to probably five. Some specialised in uh, yarns, um, and you would pick a yarn and they'd wind it off for you. It was, oh, it was so cool. It just was different. Really enjoyed just looking and wandering around. It was just beautiful. So if you're ever in France and you want to have a look at those types of places, I didn't really find them in my Google search because I typed in fabric shop or thread shop, which is a search that would find those types of outlets in Australia really easily. You've got to use the word haberdashery. It's just old school. But that probably applies to the UK too and European countries. Maybe my thinking was very Aussie fabric shop. It's probably a little bit Aussie. You've got to go back in time and I think it would have been a haberdashery store. There used to be a haberdashery store, fabric store in my hometown of Gamari when I was a little girl. That store, if we ever needed anything, it was there. It was just, oh, as a kid, with a interest in this type of thing, not realising how much of an interest it would develop into, but obviously my instinct was there. I just... I don't know. If I walked into that shop, I swear I <laughs> I swear I heard angels singing. The ladies that were running those shops back in the day, and there was a few in my time, some of them, oh, they were just lovely. They were encouraging. It was catch up on all the news for the community. A couple were a little bit mean and angry. So you'd always feel like you were intruding if you were asking for something or some advice on a pattern or... Yeah, so, typical country town. If you're in Queensland on the Fraser Coast and you want to see one still operating today, well, actually, I'm not sure for how long, to be honest, go to a little town called Howard and you will see a drapery haberdashery store still functioning it is amazing it's like going back in time the van kooten family have had it for oh, i'm going to say 70 plus years now i'm not sure of the history i wouldn't be surprised if 
um, there was a second generation there, maybe even a third in that little town. And it's still operating. Having said that, the um, gentleman of sort of our generation and his wife have passed over the last few years. And I believe the business is going on the market um, at the end of this financial year. So June, they're doing a lot of sales. So if you want to go for a drive, it's about three and a half hours out of Brisbane. It is a, a little town with this fantastic drapery, haberdashery store. So I'm on their Facebook page and I'm noticing that they're doing 30% off fabrics at the moment. So if you've got the weekend and you want to go for a spin, go to Howard. It's just off the Bruce Highway. And then if you do do it, book yourself a room, stay overnight somewhere around Harvey Bay and then go to Dew Drop Inn. It is a fantastic fabric store in Harvey Bay. And then as you work your way back to, look, I'm giving you a road trip here. As you work your way back to the Bruce Highway from Harvey Bay, you'll need to go through Maribara. And there's a shop there called Patchwork on Palace, as in that's the name of the street it's on. That street is a bit of a cut through as well. It saves you going into Maribara itself. So you can turn off the Harvey Bay Road dodge up palace street i think it's p-a-l-l-a-s and you will see the little patchwork shop and then continue on towards the bruce highway and you're on your way back to brisbane so i highly recommend that if you want a weekend away a fabric weekend away go and do it you'll find treasures and those shops do remind me of the ones i saw in paris so, yeah, if you got an opportunity to hit the road and you're in southeast Queensland and you haven't seen the drapery at Howard yet, boy, get in the car and go, guys, because it may not be with us for too much longer. I hope someone buys it and um, keeps the business going because it's a little bit of a cornerstone. Some of my friends and family have suggested that I buy it, but um, no, I've got enough work on my plate. Gosh, if you ran one of those stores, let's say you bought a fabric store, I think it'd be really hard to have find time to actually do needlework and that. You'd, it'd be a lot of work. So not for me. But it would be fun, wouldn't it? So it'd be interesting to see what happens to that little little fabric store. I'm sure all my girl mates that are in that area will be like, oh yes, go and check it out. There's quite a few ladies that watch that are from that region. So they're very familiar with the treasures that are in that store. It's one of those places, the more you dig, the more you find. I'm just working backwards and forwards on this corner. I hope I'm in shot. I get into a rhythm with the stitching and I don't look at the camera. So I'm sure you're all busy stitching anyway. There's nothing really new to what I'm doing. I'm just, just fiddling around with thread. So at the end of this video, I'll put some random photos of some of the shops that we went into. They are just, oh, it's just look, looking at a jar of lollies. I know um, my friends, Marianne and Chelsea, they did quite a lot of shopping in there. Marianne bought some gorgeous buttons that she hopes to use on her Roxy Journal of Stitchery down the garden path project she bought some little rabbits and oh some gorgeous buttons and chelsea she was enthralled with clothing that has been embellished she 
she said at one point, which I thought was just adorable, she said, the trip had made her feel creative again. I think when you're young, you get so caught up in um, building your career, building your assets, you know, finding the love of your life, all of those fun things that happen when you're young. So the creativeness that you may have been experiencing as a younger person, like a little girl in a country store going to a haberdashery store, is lost for a brief amount of time. So that was really lovely to hear that being surrounded by a group of ladies that have all got different passions, like some were quilters, some were hand sewers, some were painters, so it was all sorts in our group. Being surrounded by those types of ladies, I think Chelsea really felt the energy of that. And then immersed Chelsea in history, where she sees fabrics and buttons and ribbons and trims, like, you know, the girl can draw too. She's a very creative girl. So she's got huge potential. She has done some paintings in the past for a little extra pocket money and sold them. So she certainly has a creative eye. I know she does a fantastic job within our business because she just loves the decorating of the Christmas trees and she makes wreaths and garlands and all sorts of decorative pieces for people to purchase through our business for Christmas. So she's definitely got the eye. And I think dropping her into Paris with those ladies, uh, I think it just literally blew her mind, to be honest. So Chelsea purchased things that she can adorn her clothes with. She had this pair of jeans on that had these huge applique butterflies on them. I think she got them from Cotton On just before she... Um, left for the tour and every one of us was like oh those butterflies and it was like they got a piece of denim cut it into the shape of a butterfly ragged up the edge and then slow stitched them onto the pants of course they used sewing machines but it had that look that it had been hand done looked looked really cool and everyone commented on it which sort of made her think about what she could do to adorn her clothing. So through the week, she was buying things that could be added to a denim jacket, for example. Roll forward to the end of the week and we were at the big flea market and um, there was sections of this flea market that was dedicated to vintage clothing and Chelsea and her mum disappeared into that and... At the end of the day, when we met up to sort of make our way back, um, she pulled out of a bag this amazing khaki green denim. Was it denim? Yeah, it, it, it was denim. It was a cotton heavy jacket. And someone had already started to embellish it with just random things, but it looked so cool. And she got it for, I think it was like $30 Australian. So it really, I could just see it was inspiring her to maybe find some pieces of fashion and do some embellishing herself. So that was really good to watch that. By the end of the week, she was, yeah, really inspired. I hope we can keep that going because... You know, it's like you get back to the real world and before you know it, you've got a project in the cupboard, which is okay. Like at the end of the day, she's only young and she's got a lot going on in her world because she's a young person. So we won't hold it against her if it ends up in the cupboard because one day it'll come out of the cupboard. We've all been there. We've all got stuff in our cupboards, don't we, ladies? <laughs> but it was fun to watch her be creatively inspired. I think we all sort of felt that. 
I think everyone's heads were buzzing as we spotted different creations around the place. So I've got to the pictures there of um, just some of the random things I spotted in the haberdashery store. So I hope you enjoy that. There is a also a little video I'll put on there of this chapel. I still for the life of me can't remember the name. The back of the postcard tells me nothing. I'll try and find out what it is and put it on the video. But this district around this chapel is a very big fabric district. A lot of very old families still have fabric stores like they started many generations ago just with a cart and then slowly bought a building and then another layer of that building. And yeah, there's big names there. And if you were, for example, wanting to uh, get some fabric for a wedding dress, you'd probably go there. If you wanted to buy fabric to recover a couch, you'd go there. I tend to notice with France that like industries are together. So here you'd have fabric shops splattered all over the place in Brisbane. So you'd spend all day just driving around. But um, in France, they're all in a district. I'm sure there's other districts that are fabric orientated, but it's like you can go there and wander the streets and you're immersed in fabric from many, many different businesses, which just makes for a lovely day out. It's a very different way of shopping. <clears throat> Wouldn't that be a nice way to do it? But instead of scattering, scattering stores all over the place, you just go to the one place. And you can view, you know, 50 different businesses. It's like a district of fashion or a district of thread or a district of fabrics. Mind you, I can't remember a lot of that place because that was the day Casper nearly got caught but didn't. So it was like the peak of my frustration of having my cat down a drain pipe, who from, we believe, was just having a right old good time, just putting us through the stress. It ruined my husband's week as he kept trying to catch this cat and encourage him to get out. We, he even hired a cage. We, um, he rang the council. I pricked my finger. I've got to be a bit careful here. I don't want to get my DNA on this. So I'm just giving it a moment. So, yeah, no, hubby rang the council to see if he could hire a um, cat cage that they use to catch feral cats. And they said, oh, yeah, you can, but it's a two-week wait for one. And then they suggested going to... It's a company called Canards in Australia and they hire um, all sorts of items that workmen would use on the job site. So um, generators and trailers and vans and jackhammers, you know, all that type of stuff. So we happen to have a Canards next door to our business at Slacks Creek. So we know them, they're actually our neighbours, so we know the lads really well. And uh, so Gaz went down there and said, boys, the cat's down the drain. I understand you guys have cat cages. So he hired a cat cage, got it home. And that evening he planned to go down, put Casper's supper in the cage, hoping that he would wander in and we'd have him and be able to get him out. And of course the cat cage didn't fit. So that idea was a bust. So then he's like, in the hole trying to coax this blooming cat out with, you know, come on, puss, puss. He wasn't having any of it. He just sat there on some leaf matter and watched him. He was only about three, two metres away most of the time. And um, he then hopped on the internet and found there was a, a different sized cage that looked like it would do the trick, but it was in New Zealand. So we spoke briefly, you know, do we order this cage from New Zealand? 
and I, I don't know, I sort of thought, no, nah, give it another go. I, you've got to be quiet. Don't have any people from the neighbourhood street watching. You know, all the noise had to be gone. This cat was sitting down there listening and if he could hear strange voices, there was no way he was going to come to Gaz. And he knew Gaz by then would give up, go back inside and his supper would just be sitting there on his little plate waiting for him. So I honestly think that cat knew what he was doing. And he certainly had plenty of water and food like he was just hanging out. So we decided not to order the cage from New Zealand. And I'm glad we didn't because two days later he actually came out on his own steam. So, oh, can't you tell I'm still traumatised? Blooming cat. Anyway, if I go on a holiday, Casper's going on a holiday. Why not? That's what he would have thought. So the theory behind my stitching here is wherever the background is showing, I'm just doing a straight running stitch. Just backwards and forwards. It's going quite quickly. And that's because my needle and thread are just shimming through so easily. But it's going to give it quite a quilted effect. I could be a bit slicker and not do this process and the job would be done, but I don't know, I just want to enjoy it. So I'm doing it. Now this piece of green fabric, I wonder what I could do there. I wonder. Should I be brave and get some green thread? Do I have a green thread that matches that? Maybe do a little line of fly stitch or something. Right, so that's as far as I can go with that thread. Um, where's my threads? So I haven't really been in my room for a week or so. The threads from down the garden path. Let's have a look. Hang on, guys. <clears throat> Just grabbing my basket. Oh, I know what maybe I could play with. This was a thread that Susanna spotted in one of the haberdashery stores. It's a DMC gold lame. And uh, it caught her eye and she was like, maybe it won't, you know, fall apart on us easily. Let's have a little stitch with that. That's a memory. So Susanna kindly wound a heap off of the ball onto a little piece of card and um, gave me a little sample of it. So let's have a play with it. I wonder if you've had a chance, Susanna, to play with yours. Susanna's gone on to the UK. So she's away a good month. She's visiting, I believe, her brother. She's house-sitting for her brother in the UK. So she's really having a good time. So what can we do here? Maybe I like the idea of the fly stitch. Do we do it down the edge or do we do it up here? Let's do it. A little bit of Susanna here, a little bit of sparkle. Another little memory. We went to a thread store too. Oh, overwhelming. There were so many different threads. Now I believe um, 
Lisa has put together a thread package. So once a month you get a pack of these threads, a different color each month. And it's a brilliant idea because it gives you a chance to just have a play with a heap of different threads. So I'm very tempted. And I was, you know, looking at different threads and packages in the store. And once again, if anything, I got a little bit overwhelmed by it. It wasn't easy to work out the pricing of everything because it was only a small little store and we were all crammed in there. And some of the girls were so excited and just shopping up a storm. So I thought, oh, I'll just pull back a little bit and just have a good look at the, the eye candy. <laughs> and um, if anything, the brand is everywhere. So it sort of gave me... A little bit more confidence that if I did decide to buy some silk threads I know the brand now and um, yeah I feel a little more educated and if I am so inclined I could do the thread um, oh I like this Susanna this threads beautiful it's a DMC so it should be available out there I think we need to get a ball of this. It was like a big crocheted ball, like sort of like this, but bigger. I might have to do a bit of Googling and see if I can find it. It's beautiful, Susanna. It's sliding through the fabric beautifully. Oh, I love how it's put a little bit of sparkle on my work. I think she spotted it in one of the haberdashery stores. can't remember now it's all a blur it's just too much so they um the little chapel well it wasn't little it was huge this church at the very top I was standing up here where that railing is I did a video of France I panned around through this whole vista that I could see with my back to the chapel so I'll put that video at the top it's like seeing Fran uh, Paris from a bird's eye view and the other thing you'll notice is I zoom into the railings up here and everyone's putting those locks it's been a bit of a thing in Paris for some time you buy a gold lock and you write your name and your lover's name on it and you attach it to the railings of the bridges well um it's become a bit of a problem because you imagine millions of people visit paris they walk across those bridges they all attach locks pretty much the weight of those locks is tons it's hard to imagine but it is tons and tons so the poor old bridges are starting to show fatigue so the council is having to come along and cut all the locks off. And of course, then everyone puts more locks on. So it's become quite a cost to the city, these blooming locks that tourists attach to bridges. And now they're doing it on the um, old metal railing that runs across the top of that um, wall. And there's, there's millions of locks there, it, millions. And I can just see the council would have their engineers out and going, yeah, this is not a good thing. There we go. There's my little gold fly stitch. Oh, I love that. Oh, Susanna, we have to track down this thread. Where's my phone? I need to Google it now because that is brilliant. It's like plaited. Yeah, it's plaited and wrapped. So it doesn't come undone when you're working with it. Let me just get my phone. I like the colour too. It's subtle. It's just a pretty little... Okay. Let's, let's go to Google. Now, Susanna's written... DMC L U M I N A. Let's have a look. Aha! Uh -huh. We've got it. 
So there's a silver and the gold. Where have you been in my life? And this place is on Etsy. There we go. That's it there. Yep. Great. Is this an Australian seller? Can't tell. So it comes in a silver, a platinum, a gold. Oh, look at that. I wonder which colour this was. 3821. 3866. And then there's three, uh, 677. So there you go, guys. That's the thread, Crochet Cotton DMC. Mm. I might, let's see. Oh, look, it comes in heaps of different colors. Gosh, where have you been? How come I'm only finding this out? There's so much out there. The Wool Warehouse has it in the UK. New Zealand stitch, knit and stitch has it in New Zealand. Uh, heaps of American sites. Outback Yarns in the UK have it. Okay, so you'll find it. How beautiful. All right, there you go. I've had a play with something new. Susanna, good work, girl. Now I'm not going to be able to stop adding my little bit of Got a little bit left. What can we do with it? Maybe I do a few little stitches up here. I really like fly stitch. So I'm going to just pop this last little skerrick of it down through here. So I will just keep meandering across my piece of cloth, adding stitches to where I think it complements the piece. At the end of the day, it's just adding little details. Oh, I like that. The last thing I thought I'd be adding is metallic. You just never know where these pieces are going to take you. Couch. That's the word. You couch down thread. That's what I did there. Goodness sakes. It's like 5am in the morning. I couldn't sleep. That Paris time is still messing me around a little bit. A little bit of jet lag still. I'm finding I'm having this afternoon nap, which then ruins my sleep for the rest of the night. So every day I hope I get through without needing that little nap. So far, no. <laughs> but no rush. I'm sort of just letting my body come back to Aussie time. All right, just got that stitch in. There we go, I've used every little, little bit. So you can see how stitching a piece of cloth when you're on holidays, adding to it pieces from your holiday is just a lovely way of creating a textual journal. So yeah, something to consider. See the little fly stitch down there and that one there? Just subtle. Now, I, just before I go, I might just zoom up a little bit and we'll just double check that everything's going well for the construction of the pockets for the postcards. So remember we had about a three, three and a half inch turned up side. And then the postcards would pop in like so. Where are some postcards? Let's get a 
couple of them. So they'll sit in there with all their mates. And then I will stitch these little pockets closed. I think it'll only be one line of stitching. I don't think I need two. We'll see. Haven't thought that far yet. Then once that's done, of course, you'd have your background fabric go through first. That will then fold over like so. That will fold over. I am going to add a tie here. At the moment, I'm still using the piece of cordage that was gifted to me from um, Pauline, who runs the Paris Stitching Tours that assisted us to get around. And then that will fold close like that. But I also will have this, whoops, just trying to be gentle here because nothing's held into position. I'm also going to have this flap come down. It won't be secured because you want to get your cards in and out, but it will help hold the cards in so that they don't fall out on me. Okay, and then that's my booklet. So the tie will be in there, and then I have an opportunity of creating a tie around the whole thing, and that's my postcard wrap, which encompasses all my treasures. And then the other idea that we had right at the very beginning was to add into those seams there and an additional booklet, which would have to be like that. And then I could put some more stitching or treasures on that. So I'm just not 100% sure yet, guys. I just don't know. I sort of feeling that the, as it's coming together, that I don't want to do that. I'm sort of feeling like that's another project for another day, but I'm not sure. I think I'll just keep carrying on, see where this goes. Would be nice to thumb through some stitchery within the postcards and the postcards come out. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, what fun. I love it when I don't really have a plan and we're just sort of bumbling our way through because who knows, I might think of something else. Nothing set in stone. Not when you're doing slow stitch. And that's the beauty of it. Because it's slow, it gives you time to think and enjoy the project which is good, really, really good. Okay, all right, guys, I will leave it at that. We did quite a bit, got all that stitch down, lots of stitches in amongst it, highlighted here, a bit of a decorative thing here. Yeah, love it. Very impressed with that. Going to need to track down some of the other colours, I think. All right, guys. I hope you've enjoyed your time with me and I hope you got lots of stitching done too. Nothing like an hour of stitching. All right, guys, I'll leave you in peace. Enjoy your day and, um, yeah, see you in the next video. Bye for now.